so welcome back and now i am open for discussion i have first started 1197 gh raisoni vagholi pune over to you hp hmm? is greater than hp star right okay sir and the difference is again given that uh, but why it is a he is equal to h star is given there i not uh, getting that wherever you see this greater than or equal to signs or less than or equal to signs these are inherited from the eta less than or equal to eta r which comes out of the carnot theorem equal to here means the reversible limit so in the limiting case it will be equal to and i put i have said in the morning lecture that i have the habit of putting less than or equal to as two separate signs to be conscious of the fact that equal to is a very special case the reversible limit i think right from the carnot theorem i have been using this less than or equal to as two signs stacked one above the other or greater than or equal to as two signs and i have explained to you and i will again say that that is my habit i like that habit because it gives the special status to that equal to sign but you are free to use the mathematically greater than or equal to or less than or equal to sign the standard which you find in any book over to you the entropy of a system increases as we approach absolute zero Is it a statement related to some law, or a generalized observation in thermodynamics? It is not the statement of any law of thermodynamics, because for our purpose we have only three laws of thermodynamics: zeroth, first, and second. Apart from that, we have certain premises which we said about non-quantization, continuous variation, approach to equilibrium, and things like that. what the statement which you have made is neither a law nor a general observation because depending on the material the in the state space the entropy will change so it is not necessary that as you approach uh, lower and lower temperature the entropy of uh, any material will go on increasing and increasing or decreasing and decreasing it all depends on the material at hand over to you Okay, thank you. BMS College of Engineering, one two two five, Bengaluru. Over to you. You have told that uh, entropy increases only with adiabatic condition, but there is no such adiabatic condition which we can have it in practically when we do it. But uh, how to consider that it is not uh, that is adiabatic or anything? In micro channels, we are working. Oh. see uh, let me restrict only to thermodynamics in thermodynamics everything is about limits what is possible what is not possible and some constraints first law puts a constraint of equality second law puts a constraint of inequality and that inequality means there is a limit and that limit is the reversible limit okay through that it turns out that uh, the definition of delta s requires dq by t for a reversible process so in the it's a limiting definition of delta s delta s or ds in practice is never calculated by doing a reversible experiment and then measuring dq we have determined property relations so we measure one property set and with respect to that you determine the other property set for example the whole state space of a fluid within reasonable range of pressure and temperature say for example water the whole state space of water all the properties are based on only the following set of information number 1 at various pressures and temperature you determine what is the density of water so measurement of density all over the state space number 2 from triple point to the critical point the pressure temperature saturation state measurement okay only the pressure and temperature measurement density measurements anyway are done on the liquid end as well as on the vapor end okay. 
and third the value of specific heat of water or specific heat of in particular water vapor at very low pressures as a function of temperature. Only these three pieces of information are needed for us to determine all properties enthalpy, entropy, internal energy, everything else throughout the state space of water. It can be shown that this is done and uh, in advanced thermodynamics or second course in thermodynamics, I provide enough details of how this is done and which is the proper way to proceed. But in this course, we do not have enough time to explain all that. But the germ of all that, the germs or the heart of all that is all there in our topic 10 and the associated exercise sheet on PR, property relation. Over to you. MKSSS Pune 1101, over to you. My question is, regarding open system and control volume. Can you please explain the difference between an open system and a control volume? There is, there is no difference between an open system and a control volume. They are one and the same. Two names for the same stuff. Just the way we have a closed system, sometimes we simply call a system, sometimes we call it a control mass. So, wherever you see open system, you can replace it by control volume and wherever you see control volume, you can replace it by an open system. Both nomenclatures are used in textbooks of thermodynamics all over the place. For second question, uh, in case of uh, compressors, we consider ideal uh, compression as an isothermal compression. Then for the axial flow compressors, why we define the isentropic efficiency as the ideal efficiency? What is ideal is to be determined by the user. Okay. If you are, for example, in a gas turbine or in a Brayton cycle power plant, the ideal compressor will not be considered an isothermal compressor, it will be considered an adiabatic compressor for the simple reason that after compressor, you have to further heat the gas in the combustion chamber. But if you are considering some industrial process where you need uh, some gas, you have some gas at room temperature and room pressure. Uh, ambient pressure, you want it at a high pressure, but again at ambient temperature, then perhaps your compressor, ideal compressor would be an isothermal compressor, because your inlet state and exit state are uh, isothermal. So, the intervening process, if also it is an isothermal, that will be a good idea. So, in that application, you may consider an isothermal compressor is an ideal compressor, but in a power plant where the compressor and the combustion chamber together do the job of providing enthalpy rise, adiabatic compressor will definitely be an ideal compressor. Thermodynamically, there is no such thing as an ideal compressor. It is for us to define what is ideal for us. Thermodynamically, there is only one ideal and that is a reversible process of any kind. Over to you. Sir, regarding the question number 2.15, F 2.15. Can you please explain? Uh, now, F 2.15, let us read it aloud. We have a rigid metallic container. Okay. Rigid means no change in volume. Obviously, expansion work will be 0. Oh, metallic means it is unlikely to be insulated and we should be alert to that fact. It is separated into two equal parts by a thin partition. Okay. So, we have this metallic container and we have a thin partition in between, equal parts, okay, equal volume. So, if this is V, this also is V. One part contains 1 kg of saturated liquid water at 100 degrees C. So, we have here 1 kg water, I should not write H2O, the chemists will catch me there. Hundred degrees C saturated liquid. The other part is evacuated. This is the initial state. 
the partition is broken and the equilibrium re established after some time. Okay. During the process, the temperature of the system is maintained by immersing it in an oil bath maintained at 100 degrees C. So, there is some oil bath can be modeled as a thermal reservoir, there will be some heat exchange if required so that the final temperature is also 100 degrees C. Determine the final state of steam, work done, heat transferred. Okay. Now, let us look at how the process is going to look like. I am writing specific volume, you are free to consider the actual volume, that capital V, it will look slightly different. Now, let us say that this is the 100 degree C isotherm. Initially, initial state was 1, 100 degree C, the uh, corresponding pressure which will be 1.01325 bar this is the initial state 1. Now, what is common between the initial state and the final state? The final state has a volume twice the initial state. We know that V 2 equals twice V 1 and that automatically means because it is a closed system, your specific volume 2 will be twice the specific volume 1. So, if this happens to be V 1, the specific volume V 2 will be twice V 1. Finally, the temperature is also 100 degrees C. So, the final state will be state 2. I have not shown the process. The line which you see is the isotherm representing 100 degrees C. If you want to show the process, you will say that look just like that other problem in second law which we saw yesterday. This happens to be a uh, uh, irreversible process, it is also a non quasi static process. So, I can just show it by means of a dotted line from 1 to 2. If you draw a big enough diagram, a big version of this, this will be state 1, this will be the state 2, but what you see here, this line is the isotherm at 100 degree C. The actual process can only be shown by means of a dotted line. So, the final state is given by, state 2 is given by V 2, which is 2 V 1 and T 2 is 100 degree C. So, this gives you the final state and then you apply first law to obtain everything. First, you notice that work done. Work done is expansion work plus some other type of work if any. There cannot be any expansion work because there is no system to receive that work. It is purely an expansion into a vacuum. So, expansion work is 0. There is no mention of a stirrer, no mention of any electrical connection. So, other type of work can be assumed to be 0. The net result is sub problem B, work done is 0 final state of system we have determined in terms of T 2 V 2. So, you can determine pressure will also it will be at some dryness fraction. So, the pressure will be the saturation pressure at 100 degree C and you can read out all the other properties as required. And now, the heat transfer comes out of the first law. Remember heat transfer comes always out of Q equals delta E plus W. we have shown that W is 0. So, delta E will be delta U plus delta E other. Delta U you can compute out from the initial state 1 and the final state 2 and delta E other you can assume to be 0 because there is no mention of any change in position or change in velocity. You can set up a uh, a more complicated version of this problem. For example, um, you can say the initially the uh, 
system is at a height of maybe 1000 meter in the final state that it falls at ground level and finds itself in a big pool of water which is at 100 degrees C or some other temperature which you feel like having. In that case the initial state has a large uh, gravitational potential energy, final state has much lower gravitational potential energy. So that term will have to be included in the heat transfer. I think somewhere uh, pertaining to second law or later there is a problem which is similar to this. I think it is uh, combined laws CL6, we will come to that on Wednesday on page 19, that have always been put here. Over to you. 1182 NK Orchid College, Solapur. Over to you. Uh, sir, uh, my question is uh, as the pressure increases, why does latent heat of evaporation uh, decreases? As pressure increases, why does the latent heat of evaporation decrease? There is no thermodynamic reason for this. Thermodynamics only says that properties are related to each other change in temperature with pressure along the saturation line, the so called latent heat that is HFG, the temperature and the specific volume of liquid and vapor. Thermodynamics does not say why, thermodynamics will only say that if it decreases something else will become like this, that is all. There is no thermodynamic reason for that. Uh, one more question sir, yeah. uh, in uh, F2.3, it is a constant pressure process, X1 uh, is supposed to be a dryness fraction 0 0.5 yeah. and T2 is given as uh, 400 degree centigrade. Right, so the initial state is T1 pi bar X1.5, so it is uh, wet steam at a dryness fraction of 0.5 at 5 bar. And the final state is uh, 400 degrees C and the process which we consider is a constant pressure process. So the final state is P2 is 5 bar, T2 is 400 degrees C. So you can determine, you know, locate that state on the state space and you can read off all the properties. Uh, more than saturation temperature. So, uh... Yeah, it will be a superheated steam. But this is something which happens in a boiler. For example, in a boiler at some stage you will have a dryness fraction 0.5. As further heat is added, if we neglect the pressure drop in the drum and the pipelines, then you will first uh, at that pressure uh, it will become saturated. At 5 bar you can read off the saturation temperature. So, the initial temperature will be 5 bar saturation, so 151.9 Celsius, it will become tri saturated because it is a constant pressure process. So, it will become x equal to 1, temperature 151.9, pressure will remain 5 bar. Beyond that, it will go to superheat and then if you come to superheat tables, page 12 it goes up to 400 degrees C. So, slowly it will go to superheat of uh, superheat temperature of 200, 250, 300, 350, 400. Even the tabulation at 400 is tabulated for you, 5 bar 400 degrees C that is the final state. It is a process in which the evaporation gets partly completed from 0.5 to 1 and after that superheating takes place. Over to you. College of Engineering Pune. Which thermodynamic processes available on sun, moon and earth? See, the moon and earth are connected mainly by gravitation. There are hardly any thermodynamic links between the moon and the earth. There are of course, I mean for example, energy gets transferred by radiation from the sun to the earth directly, also indirectly by uh, reflection from the moon. The moon has its own temperature, so it radiates some uh, energy, part of it is uh, intercepted by earth. So, there are uh, um, uh, links, but the main earth moon linkage is gravitational. If it were not there, moon will just uh, go fly away tangentially from its orbit. But of course, there are, there will be issues when the earth moon link may be considered. Uh, 
in some planetary science or atmospheric science, uh, it will have to be considered. And if you set up a uh, colony on the moon or some equipment on the moon, uh, what I understand is uh, as the moon goes through its various phases, uh, we see only one face of the moon, but at any point the temperature may be as high as 150 or 200 Celsius if it is on the sunny side and it may drop to something like minus 100 or minus 150 Celsius when it is in the middle of the non sunny sides. So, it will go through um, at a period of typically one month which is the moon cyclic period, it will go through significant thermal oscillations. So, uh, for equipment and uh, people and things on the moon that uh, will be something which will have to be considered. So, it will go through a cyclic thermodynamic process once every 28 or 29 days as needed. Over to you. Uh, okay, sir. Another question. Sir, so many years we are studying Joule's law, Carnot cycle, uh, like uh, Stephen Boltzmann law, so many laws. But after that, so many PhD holders uh, done a lot of uh, research. But this is included in the syllabus or not? See, uh, the purpose of PhD is not to produce material which gets included in the syllabus. I think that must have stopped happening uh, long ago when the basics were developed. Nowadays, I do not think anything, uh, the PhD work has become so specialized that you tend to learn a lot about a very small thing and uh, such specialized small things do not generally end up with textbooks, particularly do not end up with undergraduate textbooks at all. I think if uh, undergraduate textbooks differ, they because they differ because of newer topics are included, not because esoteric uh, high level research work is included. Over to you. Thank you, sir. 1219 Prestige Institute, Indore, over to you. I would like to know something about unsteady flow process, please. There is nothing special about unsteady flow process. If you want unsteady flow process in open systems, I have here uh, start solving the exercises. For example, I uh, will tell you the typical unsteady flow problems we have is OS19, OS20. OS23, these are simple unsteady flow processes. I, I want to know something about energy balance, sir. Energy balance is nothing but first law of thermodynamics. If first law of thermodynamics is satisfied, you say energy is balanced. And the fact remains that energy flows are always balanced because they always have to satisfy the first law of thermodynamics. So, when somebody says that the energy balance for my plant is satisfied, that only means you have done the measurements and the calculations correctly. So, it means mass multiplied by specific energy that has to be considered. Yes, you said it right, you have to say specific energy. Thank you. 1161 Anurag group of institutions, Ranga Reddy, over to you. Up to pressure 30 bar, the enthalpy is increasing. Yes. Enthalpy of dry saturated vapor is increasing. After that, it is reducing. Right. Why is it so, sir? No, this is just a thermodynamic characteristic, nothing special about it. Thermodynamics does not dictate it to be so. It just turns out to be so. How many properties need for internal energy when the system is closed? If you have a closed system and if you uh, consider uh, only one work mode, one two way work mode, then two properties will decide the state of a system and hence two properties will decide the internal energy of the system. If the number of work modes is higher than two, the appropriately higher number will be needed. And why it is one for rudimentary system? Can you explain that one? Because for a rudimentary system, the typical example which I took is the mercury in glass thermometer. For such a system, there is no two way work mode which is available. Hence, the number of properties which decide the state of the system is simply one. 
and that is that is why we consider them as important systems on their own because they are very useful in uh, measurement and calibration of temperature. Over to you. 1195 Bansal College, Mandi Deep, Bhopal. Over to you. My question is this. Hmm? Is there any example of the process which falls under the isentropic process but it should not be adiabatic process? Is there any example? There are enough examples of this. For example, you do the following. The simplest default example. You take a vessel. You stir it. What happens? The vessel contains a liquid like say water its temperature rises, you start stirring it at a particular rate, temperature will initially rise, but then there will be some heat loss to the surroundings. Stir a liquid, heat loss to surroundings. Okay. Now, if you keep on stirring the liquid, Initially, the temperature will rise, but then you will have a balance in which the rate at which energy is made available by the stirrer is energy which is lost to the surroundings. In thermodynamic thing, this is Q dot, this is W dot, Q dot will turn out to be equal to W dot and both will be less than 0. Work will be done on the system and heat will be lost from the system. Whereas, the state of system is steady. So, this is a situation when it is steady state, your d s is 0, but there is a non-zero thermal interaction. So, this is a situation where you have an isentropic process, but a non-adiabatic process. Over to you. On heating water, it generates vapor and on condensing converts back into water. Is it reversible process? If yes, what of the heat vapor dissipated in atmosphere? And if no, how? Because uh, we are regaining water completely. See, you are looking at just one aspect that water is getting evaporated, that evaporated uh, steam or evaporated vapor is becoming water again. But the requirement for reversible is it should be inverted, everything should trace back to its original position. You should ask yourself the question, what is it that is causing the water to evaporate? For example, if you are keeping the water in a uh, saucer out in the sun, it is absorbing the sun rays and evaporating, then the condensation, the reverse should require that the vapor condense into the saucer, the saucer should uh, re-radiate or back radiate the radiation from itself towards the sun or if you are evaporating the water on a stove by burning gas, well there should be a reverse flame which absorbs heat from the vessel, converts it into unburned gas and pushes it back into the cylinder. All this thing is required for it to be a reversible process. See, we should not be under the impression that a real life process can somehow be considered reversible. Get rid of that idea. Absolutely no process in reverse life, in uh, real life is reversible. Reversible is only an idea. It is a limiting process. We have an idea of what it should be, but at the same time we realize that it is impossible to create a reversible process. That is what I said yesterday that it is a process about which we can think in any detail. There is no restriction on thoughts. So, it is a thought process, it is not a real life process at all. Okay, just the way you have a continuous function and in the limit something happens in mathematics, this is simply such a trick. It is a very useful trick because it allows us to define certain properties 
which can be then computed out using its relations with other properties. I think earlier in the day I said that although the definition of change in entropy is d s is d q by t for a reversible process, entropy is never determined in an experiment in which you execute a reversible process and measure d q by t. You always measure p v t data, maybe some other uh, related p t data and either the value of C p at one temperature, one pressure all through the various temperatures or something else. And from that the entropy values are derived over to you. When we are going beyond the critical point, mm -hmm. there is yesterday you said that there is a superheated fluids. It is nothing, it is like any other liquid or vapor. But the only thing is because you are at supercritical pressure, just increasing its temperature will make it look like a vapor, but you will not have a process of boiling in which bubbles form and liquid gets converted into vapor in a discrete fashion that will not discontinuous fashion that will not happen. So, you know we have those old textbookish ideas because the idea that something is liquid, something is vapor, these were developed when we did not even realize that there was something like a critical point. When critical point was experimentally determined and people realized that there are such states as critical states, then they realized that because of the existence of a critical point, the differentiation between the liquid and vapor is not so clear cut as it was earlier. That is why it is better to use a word like fluid whenever you mean may, may, when you mean either liquid or vapor or some flowing medium as appropriate. That is why a fluid is a better word, but even then we know we know when to call a liquid a liquid and when to call a vapor a vapor. When you are at subcritical pressures, it is perfectly safe to do this. It is only when you go to supercritical pressures that uh, you can you can convert from liquid to vapor without a process of so called boiling taking place over to you. Sir, my question is uh, can we use the laws of thermodynamics at the atomic level if yes what modifications can be done and uh, uh, while defining the laws of thermodynamics we do not consider the size of the system, it is at the micro level, uh, micro molecular level, a yeah, micro atomic level or they cannot be used for earth which is a very complex system. So, we should limit or should not we limit the laws of thermodynamics to a particular class of systems where we can consider these as a macro systems. Yes, what you can say that is partially right. For example, when you come to atomic systems, our assumption that uh, our systems form a continuum, there are no quantum effects and they are scale independent, these things break down. So, we will have to use appropriately uh, formulated or different laws of thermodynamics. Okay. But when it comes to earth, I think earth is a more or less continuous system and to which the laws of thermodynamics are applied. However, earth in all it is such a complex system that applying the law of thermodynamics will be proper, but quantitatively it will be very difficult to do. But in spite of that earth scientists and atmospheric scientists keep on doing it and they will keep on doing it and come up with better and better uh, methods of applying our own laws of thermodynamics to it. In our typical earth science or uh, atmospheric science, we do not have to worry about quantum effects and uh, uh, discrete uh, non-continuum effects. The only thing is uh, the atmosphere and the earth remember is never in a steady state, it is never in equilibrium. So, if you want to study you will have to chop it up into local systems which you can consider approximately in equilibrium. That is what we always do whenever you have a large system, uh, large enough that you will find that it is never in thermodynamic equilibrium. But yes, for earth our traditional laws of thermodynamics are applicable, no doubt about it. Over to you. My question is, uh, system and surrounding hmm. both are equilibrium, hmm. then system entropy constant are changed. No, 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 equilibrium is just a 
characteristic of state. The moment you say that one your system is in a state of equilibrium, that means all properties are uniquely known, you have unique values and so is its entropy. Surroundings is another system. If that surrounding system is also in equilibrium, it will have its own unique set of properties including entropy. Since these are two different systems, there is no link between the entropy of the two. Whenever we talk of a change in entropy, we talk of a change in entropy of a given system. We do not talk of a difference in entropy between system 1 and system 2. In thermodynamics, there is only one property which we compare between system, thermodynamic, basic thermodynamic property and that is temperature and that is brought to us by zeroth law and linked also to the second law. But we never compare for example, uh, energy of one system with energy of the other system, entropy of one system with entropy of the other system. That is something which is never done. Over to you. Chemical equilibrium system and surrounding both are in chemical equilibrium, but within a system chemical equilibrium or not? So, a system will be in total thermodynamic equilibrium only when locally there is chemical equilibrium. And that means not only the composition, but even the chemical potential is uniform within the system. It has a unique value everywhere. Over to you. Suppose, sir, uh, we are uh, defining our process 1 to 2. Right. And it is a quasi static process. Right. So, it will be possible always that it will be reversible process? No, not necessarily. A quasi static process is a process for which the path is completely defined but it may not be reversible process. I will take an example, the example is here in front of you. When you stir a liquid, it is possible that the liquid is stirred very vigorously, in which case as it is being stirred, we do not know where the liquid level is and what is the distribution of temperature and pressure in the liquid. So, it is not a quasi static process, but if I stir it very slowly, without disturbing the quiescentness of the liquid, then definitely it is a quasi static process. But we know that stirring of a liquid is never a reversible process. So, here we have a situation where it is a quasi static process, but it is not a reversible process. And why stirring of a liquid? You take uh, for example, you pour hot coffee in your uh, vacuum flask, the traditionally called thermos flask. Okay, and seal it. It is an almost adiabatic system, but we know heat is lost very slowly from the inside to the outside. So, the coffee temperature may be initially 70 degree C, but uh, as you wait long enough, it will slowly reduce and finally reach room temperature. Okay. But you are not stirring the coffee, the temperature is changing so slowly that any time you try to measure the state of that coffee, pressure, temperature, etcetera, you will find that it is uniquely defined. So, this is a quasi static process, but cooling of coffee it, when it is kept in a vessel is not a reversible process. So, there are enough examples of quasi static processes which are not reversible. In fact, um, as I said a few minutes ago, a reversible process is something which we only think about. Whereas, quasi static processes can be imagined uh, to be good approximation of real life processes. So, you can demonstrate an almost quasi static process, but you cannot demonstrate a reversible process. Over to you. 1263 Techno India Salt Lake Kolkata. Over to you. Sir, actually, my question is that uh, regarding. Uh, phase rule that you have told that when uh, saturated water and uh, dry saturated water and dry saturated uh, dry saturated uh, water and liquid when are uh, in equilibrium that means uh, in the pt diagram it is in the liquid vapor saturated line at that point you have applied phase rule and shown that uh, degree of freedom was 1 right yes, yes. And that means that uh, one degree of freedom means one property sufficient to define that state 
this is a very common confusion. The state postulate says that since for a fluid the number of two way work modes is 1, two properties are needed to define the state of a system. Okay. This is true whatever be the number of phases, whatever be the uh, uh, phase, whether it is liquid, whether it is a mixture or whether it is a uh, vapor, two properties are always needed. The phase rule tells us particularly for a single component system like water and that is where we are using it. The phase, phase rule tells us about the degrees of freedom and degrees of freedom is of the properties pressure and temperature, how many you can take together and whether pressure and temperature are independent or not. When you have just single phase, it means yes, the number of degrees of freedom is 2 and you can use, if you want you can use pressure and temperature as two independent variables. But it does not say that you have to use pressure and temperature. It says that you can use any two properties. Okay. When the number of phases is 2, when you have liquid and vapor together, the phase rule tells us that the degree of freedom is 1. That only means that of the pressure and temperature, you can select only one, not the other. The property requirement is still two, but the phase rule requirement says if you want to select two, you cannot select pressure and temperature together. You can select one of them, the second one has to be something else. But of course, the choice is that we can select, we need select neither pressure nor temperature. So, in two phase, for example, we can select enthalpy and entropy as the two properties and fix the state. But the only restriction which is put by phase rule in the two phase in the two phase zone is that pressure and temperature together you cannot choose. If you want, you can select just one of them. Over to you. Considering only pressure and temperature. Yes. Why you are not considering pressure and specific volume? These two are also intensive properties. Or why you are not considering that? The phase rule talks only about pressure and temperature, that is it. It does not talk about specific volume. Over to you. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, one question is uh, there uh, that is uh, uh, regarding the uh, property pressure that hmm. when it is in equilibrium but at different position within a closed system, pressure may be different. Because suppose in case of a bottle of water, actually pressure is different at different points then how can we call this as intensive property from this point of view? Okay. Uh, calling it an intensive property is the second question. I expected the question to be that if in a bottle of water you have uh, the pressure variation because of gravity from top to bottom, then why do you consider it in the first place to be a state of equilibrium? Now the answer to that is, uh, remember I said in the initial that property is a relevant characteristic of our system. And uh, there were people who have argued uh, with me, uh, why should that relevant be there? And there are some people who argued saying, uh, I said relevant property, but I said no, property is a property, property means a relevant characteristic. And although the characteristics come with our systems, what is relevant and what is not is left for us to decide based on our experience. Similarly, we know that in real life no system is in equilibrium, no property will have a unique value. Why the uh, pressure in this bottle, even the temperature of water in this bottle if I really make uh, precise measurements will not be uniform because I am a body at 37 Celsius. So, there will be some radiation coming from a 37 Celsius body on it. It is exposed to radiation from the lamps nearby, including the lamp on this uh, document projector. And of course, the this is an air conditioned hall, so the surrounding temperature is maybe 24 or 23 degrees C. So, there are lots of heat transfers involved and I am sure there is a nice temperature field in inside. But then the question that arises is, if I want to study it, do I really at this stage bother about that small variation in temperature and pressure? That brings me to the question, the same question rephrased. Yes, I agree that there will be non-uniqueness in some properties like temperature and pressure, 
but is that variation local variation in temperature and pressure relevant to what I am going to do and what I am going to study. If the answer is no, it is not relevant, then I say yes, I can neglect it and go ahead. But if it is relevant, then I will say I cannot neglect it, I cannot consider this whole system to be a system which is in a state of equilibrium and then depending on the variation, I will have to convert it into smaller subsystems and maybe hopefully each one of them can be considered to be a local equilibrium. Okay. In the study of fluid dynamics, in the study of heat transfer, we consider small control volumes or small system dx, dy, dz. Why do we do that? Because we know overall the system will be at a non-uniform pressure, non-uniform temperature or something like that and we want to study that non-uniformity. But we have to apply our laws of thermodynamics. So, we take small pockets of it and we will say locally let it be in equilibrium so that locally we are confident of defining a temperature and pressure. There will be situations and I will bring your attention to the exercise 1 W i 0.4. This exercise W i 0.4 where you have a piston which acts like a dam and which has water on one side. This is a situation where it should be clear to you that for the water pressure by itself will not be uniform. There will be significant differences from top to bottom. Okay. So, here to solve the problem, we will have to take care of those pressure variations and that is the first part of that problem. But when I play with the water in the bottle, I do not have to worry about the pressure difference. But if I convert tomorrow this into a fluid mechanics problem and ask you a question that look, if I make a small hole here, at what rate will the water flow out? And if I make a similar hole here, at what rate will the water flow out? Then I notice that look, if I make a small hole just at the level, hardly any water will flow out, but if I make a hole at the bottom, a large amount of water will flow out. Out there, I have to consider the vertical variation of pressure. So, whether these variations of properties are to be considered or not, it is for us to study and decide based on the situation at hand. Over to you. Sir, yes. Sir, I have one more question regarding the uh, problem of second law that you have solved uh, in the uh, two day, my activity uh, on the third day, that uh, my heat transfer is taking place between two reservoirs through a conductor. If yeah. you remember, a simple problem that you have solved for the entropy produced was to be calculated. Hmm. Heat transfer was taking place between two reservoirs through a conductor. Yeah. In that problem, uh, you have considered three systems, two reservoirs and the conductor. Mm. And you have calculated the entropy production. In that case, uh, for calculating the entropy transfer of the uh, two reservoirs, you have used the formula heat transfer by temperature. Right. And why you have considered these heat transfers are reversible? Why you are considered? This uh, reservoirs heat transfers are reversible. Okay. This is my question because the entropy produced was the uh, it, uh, it, uh, due to the of the conductor. See, the entropy produced is not because of just the conductor. The entropy produced is because of the whole process of one reservoir giving up heat and another reservoir absorbing heat, and uh, the two reservoirs are at two different temperatures. Now, a reservoir is a again like a reversible process a modeled system. It is a system with a much larger very large energy capacity or very large capacity to absorb and reject heat uh, without a significant change in temperature. Okay. And although it is difficult to uh, give a direct explanation as to why uh, the energy entropy change of a reservoir is heat absorbed by temperature. If you model a reservoir at say a system with large heat capacity working either at constant volume or constant temperature and if you take the limit of that as the capacity becomes large, the mass becomes large, then in the limit you can show that delta S is Q 
absorbed divided by temperature, where the temperature does not change in the limit. This can be even shown mathematically. Over to you. Uh, sir, I have one more question uh, regarding the uh, PS diagram. I actually want to know what is the nature of PS diagram in the solid liquid region. Can we simply extend that uh, from the liquid vapor region in the, if you please show then. Uh, well, I do not have access to a TS diagram for solid liquid region, but I think if you go to uh, the old Keenan and Keith steam tables, properties of water and steam, I think they have in it in the appendix the data of the solid liquid region. Uh, I, I do not know whether they have the TS diagram plotted, but since because you have the data for the solid liquid region, you can plot if you want it yourself. I do not know whether our steam table has any such information. We have, uh, yes, we have here uh, solid water vapor temperature. We do not have the solid liquid, but we have the uh, sub zero uh, uh, ice and vapor where steam the sublimation region, solid vapor equilibrium. It is on page 19. If you are interested, you can plot it. And if you go to uh, old thermodynamics book, by example, I think engineering thermodynamics by an old book called uh, Lee and Sears, you will find uh, three dimensional plots of the PVT diagrams and other things out there. TS diagrams may or may not be there, but the three dimensional PVT surfaces are plotted. You can take a look at them. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. 1205 Mahatma Gandhi Missions College, Noida, Uttar Pradesh. Over to you. Yeah, my question is the heat transfer that you are considering, hmm. it is reversible isothermal because you did not consider the entropy generation. Am I right, sir? No, no, no. See, entropy generation is defined as delta S minus that dQ by T. That is our definition. See the During the process, let it occupy a small amount of heat and the temperature at the boundary where the heat transfer takes place is T. Then the second law dictates that D S must be greater than or equal to D Q by T and we define dsp the small amount of entropy produced is defined as ds minus dq by t because of that this equation the second law equation using this definition can be written down as ds equal to dq by t plus dsp this is nothing but this definition turned around d s equals d q by t plus d s p and the second law then becomes d s p is greater than or equal to 0. Uh, a statement like I have not taken the entropy production into account etcetera is not a proper statement to do because entropy production is to be calculated from this. Entropy production is never, I mean, it is not uh, proper to say that entropy production is taken into account. Over to you. No, sir, if we write this expression, hmm. entropy uh, increase of the universe, hmm. let us write the system. So, suppose you have a system and you have another system which we call the surroundings. Okay. The let the entropy of the system change by delta s, let the entropy of the surrounding change by delta s surroundings. Not 
Now the so called universe its system plus surroundings, this is called universe only if, actually if and only if it is adiabatic. That means, across this boundary, there is no Q, but in between them, they can do anything they feel like. So, long as they together form an adiabatic system, we call it a universe. And since the universe has been defined as an adiabatic system, we must have delta S u greater than or equal to 0. In fact, this is actually second law says that delta S for any adiabatic system must be greater than or equal to 0. This is second law. So, since universe is adiabatic, applying second law to the universe, we get delta S u to be greater than or equal to 0. And since in this case, the universe is made up of our system and our surroundings, delta S of the universe is delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings. So, this should be greater than or equal to 0. Over to you. Expression for delta S, if we write the expression for delta S for the system mm -hmm. and delta S for the surrounding, mm -hmm. right? Suppose there is a heat transfer from the system to the surrounding. Right. Now, let us uh, concentrate over the, the heat transfer that is taking place. Mm -hmm. right? So, I want to introduce the concept here, the heat generation, the entropy generation that you gave the table, very nice table, you know, uh -huh. uh, three columns, three rows. Now, in this case, the first thing you will notice that this heat transfer is internal to this large system called the universe. So, since it is internal, we do not have to worry about it. We have to worry about it, worry about the fact that the universe totally is adiabatic. And then we write this. Now, if we apply the you know, this thing, delta S of the universe will be any this sigma q by t for the universe plus S p entropy produced of the universe. Now, by definition this will be 0, because universe is an adiabatic system. So, it simply means that the change in entropy of the universe means a the adiabatic system is nothing but the entropy produced in that universe, in that adiabatic system. This is always true. If all the processes inside the universe are reversible. All the processes inside the universe are reversible, then if that universe by definition is adiabatic, then the universe will not produce any entropy, delta S of the universe will be 0. Thank you. Over to you. Over and out.